good to be back together and, and get to have that chatter. Uh, a few things to share with you this morning before we get started. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. We invite you back every opportunity you have. If you are visiting, we'd ask that you complete one of the attendance cards and you can leave that in the collection baskets at the rear on your way out. That way, if we'd have to do any kind of contact tracing for any reason, we know who was here. <clears throat> as far as uh, those who are taking part in a public way this morning, Kim Wells will be leading our singing. David Potts will have our opening prayer. Mark Harris will lead our minds at the Lord's table. And Colt Nettie will have the scripture reading. So with that, we'll let Tim th get things started. Number 9999. Nine. Mm -hmm. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and blood and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, out with those that are ring. Heavenly portals, they live forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Hermione's Lord's Supper, the next song will not be in the book, so if just look at the screen, please. Tis at the feast divine, the bread, the fruit of the vine, and saints commune before the shrine in the supper. bow with me, please. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our mind be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. In a moment, 
I'm going to read six verses. First Peter, First Peter one through or three through nine. But before I do, I wanted to remind you to peel back that cellophane that uncovers the wafer. And then at the appropriate time, we'll give thanks for that bread. And then thereafter, we'll peel back the foil, revealing the grape juice. This uh, scripture highlights five elements to me. I hope that it will you. Living hope, salvation of our souls, inheritance, faith, and Jesus. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by the power of God are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes through it, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not know, I'm sorry, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Let's give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this emblem that represents the body of Christ on the cross. We appreciate your sacrifice, giving your only son, that we might be saved and redeemed to you. We pray, dear God, that we Find, we are found to be uh, ready to take this emblem. We pray that we can evaluate ourselves, examine ourselves, so that we can uh, take this in a mindset that is well-pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Would you bow with me? Lord, we thank you for the blood of Christ, which washes us white as snow in your sight. Lord, we want to be holy because you are holy. We thank you, Lord, that we have this memorial that we can continually remember our Savior, our friend, our brother, our King, the High Priest. We love you, Lord, and we love the Jesus. Lord, we pray a blessing upon this fruit of the vine that we know that was shed for forgiveness of sins for many. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Amen. That concludes our memorial service, our communion with the Lord. At this time, I would like to remind you that baskets have been set out in the back for your contribution made to the, the church here. Let's give thanks for that contribution. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the many blessings, financial and otherwise, Lord. We thank you for our families. We can go on and on counting those blessings. and. We pray, dear God, that we remember to acknowledge the goodness 
that you bestow upon us regularly. We pray, Lord, for the uh, contribution made today that it will be used in a manner pleasing to you. We pray for those that oversee that, our elders, deacons, and others. We thank you for their service, Lord. We thank you for all the many blessings, and especially Christ. It's his name we pray. Amen. Number 333, 333. Mm, my Jesus knows when I am lonely, he knows each pain, he sees each tear, he understands his lonely heartache, he understands. Because he cares, my Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. His heart is close and heaven is supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows when I he knows how much my heart can bear. He lifts me up when I am sinking and brings me joy beyond compare. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. His heart is When skies are dark, when hope is gone, by faith I seal his arms around me and hear him say, you're not alone. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. His heart is Yes, he knows just what I need. So before the prayer script reading, the lesson will be number 478. Four, seven. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears of their sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears of their own. Glory is waiting, waiting up yonder, where we shall spend an endless day. There with our Savior will be forever, when no more sorrow can dismay. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, no tears in heaven will be known. Some morning yonder will cease to ponder for things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, saved ones be dearer, in heaven where all will be made new. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, 
sorrow and pain will overflow. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. The song following the lesson will be number 560, 560. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity that we have together to come here together as a congregation to worship you, our one and only God, creator of all things, creator of us, knowing that you are the only one we are to worship, knowing that through you all good things have been given to us. We're so thankful for those blessings, Father. No matter how minimal it may seem or how great, we know that you love us so much that you've given us the sunshine and you give us the rain. You do all these things to help us so that we can succeed in our everyday lives. We know that you are the only God, and being the only God, you are the God that we worship. We're so thankful for each other, for our brothers here and sisters, that we're so willing to serve, to go out and spread the word, the seed that your son, Jesus, lived on this earth. He died for each and every one of us. And he was rose again, and now he's in heaven at the right hand, waiting for the day when we can all come together. Let us not forget that, Father, because that's our responsibilities and our job is to go out and spread that word in a nice, happy, healthy manner and be kind to our neighbors, no matter how bitter they may be toward us. Because it's not about them and how they treat us, but it's about us and how we treat them. We're also thankful, Father, that we live in a country here that's so richly blessed that we do have an opportunity to come and worship you on the first day of the week. We also thank Thank you, Father, that this country allows us to be free and do those things and spread your word without fear of, of being crucified or looked down upon. Father, as we think of those things, we know that our world is in turmoil. And we know that people don't know which way to turn. But through the scriptures, through the understanding, through through the path that you have given us through Jesus Christ, we know that you always show us the true way. And when people turn from the wicked and the evilness that are out there and seek you for guidance, we know that you will deliver as you have time and time again. We wait, wait so patiently, Father, for the time of your coming because we know that it's only a matter of time when that will happen. But in the meantime, let us Never forget, let us strive, work diligently to, to spread your word and be thankful that you've given us a way to get to heaven. And that way is through your son. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for when we get angry, when we get jealous, covetous, whatever the, the sins in our lives are, that we may sit back and think, this is not what it's about. It's about heaven. This earth is not what it's about, but it's about being in heaven with you and your son. Let us keep that mindful, Father, that you set that path in that way. And not let us forget it. And let us help others get there and understand. We know some will, will turn a blind ear to us. And that's always been. But don't ever let us give up. Let us strive and continue and persevere in spreading your word in good heart and manner. We thank you for so much, Father, especially your son, Jesus, who did die on that cross to give us that, that way of, of coming to you. We ask that you forgive us when we sin against thee. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> I wish you would bear with me a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we've proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put, you put up with it readily enough. Indeed, I consider that I am not in the least inferior to these super apostles. Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. Indeed, in every way we have made this plain to you in all things. And our goal ought always to make sure that the things we say, as well as the things we do, are pleasing to him. If we begin every day with that attitude and complete every day with that attitude, we'll have a good day. I want to mention that uh, Linda Hughes celebrated her birthday Friday, and I did not get a card in the mail to her. In fact, I'm out of birthday cards. And I wanted to say something special about her because when I was able to visit every week, one of the questions that I was frequently asked was, who is Linda Hughes? Because Linda sends cards to everyone. And I really regret I didn't get you one, Linda. So happy birthday for all the world to hear today and the 25 or 30 people that will actually watch this later in the week. Congratulations on another milestone. Thank you, Colton, for reading 2 Corinthians 11, the first six verses. There is in this brief narrative from the Apostle Paul an apology for what he is about to do. That may surprise you, but if you know Paul as good Bible students do, you know that one of the things that he most regretted was the need on occasion to talk about himself. He had already written in this same epistle in chapter 4, verse 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. But his apostleship is being questioned. And so he finds himself compelled to state his case. He is every whit as much an apostle as any of the others who bore that title. And then he read, or wrote, we would say in this context, his own personal pedigree, describing to the church at Corinth all that he had endured and suffered for the sake of the Savior. He does that because he has real concerns concerning them. He is afraid that just as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, that he also would beguile them, taking them from the simplicity, the King James says, that is in Christ. When I look at this text, I am specifically interested in verses 3 through 6. I am afraid that as the serpent deceived thee by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What specifically do you fear, Paul? That someone will come and proclaim another Jesus. And you will accept him. That someone will come with a different spirit. And you will embrace it. That someone will come with a different gospel. And you will accept it. 
As Bible students, I know you're aware of the warning in Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached unto you, let him be anathema. Why did he write that? Because the saints in the churches of Galatia had already begun to compromise and embrace false teaching and other gospels. But there is no other. Why would this happen? Because often we are more interested in pleasing people than pleasing the Savior. And how can it happen? Well, there are three reasons in my judgment why this thing can happen at Corinth or at any other place at any other time. First, men are often accepting of small or little changes because they are, after all, almost imperceptible, and they think that little things really don't matter. But if you've been following Kurt's study of Zechariah, you know that that prophet warned of that attitude. Don't ignore. Don't belittle small things. Just a little leak, if left unchecked, can eventually sink a big boat. A single match can destroy an entire forest. Little things matter. And when we lose sight of that, we are in real danger of being subtly by the serpent led astray. The second reason why this can happen, again in my judgment, is because men are not always the students of the Bible that they ought to be. And so we don't even recognize those subtle changes when they arise. And yet what does the Bible tell us? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word. I received a letter this past week, which I will, God willing, address in the morning, about whether or not it is right to watch TV programs that include violence, in particular westerns. Someone very conscientious, not of this congregation, not of this city, not of this county, is concerned about his soul and he doesn't want to do anything that would jeopardize that. And somebody suggested to him that he should not be watching. I assume Bonanza and Gunsmoke and things of that nature because they're not making Westerns today. And he really wants to know, am I putting my soul in jeopardy by being entertained by this violence? Well, I'll tell him in the morning when I respond that if you read the Bible, the Bible's filled with violence. As long as you don't endorse it, embrace it, and follow that example, you learn from it and profit from it. No, not watching westerns will jeopardize your soul as long as it doesn't keep you from the word. Seems pretty simple to me, but this is a very conscientious person who just wants to do what's right, as we all should. And as we study scripture, we're better equipped to be able to sort those things out. And differentiate between what is actually sinful and what is indifferent in the mind of God. Shooting people is sinful. Watching a television program or movie where you know it's all make-believe, as long as people keep their clothes on and their language clean and the kind of westerns that I grew up watching, for those kinds of westerns. Nothing wrong with that. You just need to be faithful to the book and you can differentiate between right and wrong, good and evil, make the right choices. I think, before I get to the third reason why people are so easily led astray, I think that Folks are drawn to the complicated rather than the simple. When something is said to be simplistic, you can pretty well be sure it's right. 
but the folks who level the charge don't want to accept it, and so they belittle whatever the message might be by saying, it's just simplistic. Let me tell you, when it comes to God and the world, God is always right. The world generally is wrong unless it comes over to God's side. And the things that we may think are foolish are really profound. And the things that we may think are profound are really, in the eyes of God, quite foolish. Isn't that the argument of 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, relative to the cross? We preach Christ crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block under the Greeks' foolishness, but unto us which are saved, the power of God. You see, the Greeks and the Jews got it wrong. One of the most profound messages ever proclaimed was proclaimed by means of the cross. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah speaks for God. Here is his message. My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts, and my ways than your ways. When you think you've got it all figured out, and you haven't got it where God has it, you don't have it figured out at all. He's always right. When we go our way, we seldom are. That's why in Proverbs 14, 12, and again, by the way, in 16, 25, Solomon said, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And Jeremiah simply said, it is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. On our own, we are hopeless and helpless. That's why we need to be students of the book, so that we can recognize the subtlety of the serpent. And those little changes that can ultimately destroy everything. Stay with God in his word. And that's what Paul is pleading for here with the saints at Corinth when he says that he is afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent cunningly or subtly, so these saints at Corinth will experience a similar fate. Again, my third point, we have a tendency to focus on and favor the complicated and complex over the easy and the simple, the very thing that God's word warns against. Let me give you an illustration or two of this. If you, in the dead of winter, out in the country, with roads covered with snow, get hung up in a ditch. That used to happen to me as a kid, you know, a teenager driving all the time. The last time I was actually in a ditch and unable to get out, I wasn't driving. We had to get my brother-in-law to pull us out. But when I was a teenager, this happened a lot. And if you knew where I grew up and had seen the roads that I traveled every day, you'd understand why exactly. You're on one of those roads, it's, let's say it's midnight, you're hung up, and off in the distance, you see a little cabin. You can't spend the night in your automobile hung up in a ditch, so you make your way to the cabin. You walk in, you have a match, and you notice there's a kerosene lamp, there's an oil heater, and... There's a wood-burning stove. What are you going to light first? Yeah, the match. Who said that? Thank you, Dave. You'd be surprised how many people struggle for an answer. But there's only one correct answer. You've got to light the match first. But we will often overthink things. In a baseball or softball game, how many outs are in an inning? Well, three plus three is six, but you'd be surprised how many people think there are only three outs in an inning. If I said I have in my hand, and this is illustrated because I don't have the coins with me today, but I said I have in my hand two American coins which total 55 cents, and one of them is not a nickel. Remember, one of them is not a nickel. What two coins do I have? Well, obviously, a nickel and a 50-cent piece. Because only one of them is not a nickel, the other one was. But we overthink it. 
And if a farmer had 17 sheep and all but nine died, how many would he have? Well, obviously nine. All the others died. And if you're su subtracting 17 minus 9 equals 8, you haven't listened. But that happens a lot. It happens in just about every realm of life and particularly in relationship to God. Now, having said all of that, I want to ask three questions this morning for your consideration. Remembering that we're going to be smarter than Eve and wiser than the Corinthians and not be led astray by the subtleties of the serpent. What is man's greatest problem today? The answer is sin. We don't know that as a society because we've airbrushed sin out of culture. Nothing is necessarily evil anymore if you don't understand that that is modern thinking. You are obviously not living in the 21st century because that's where we are today. It is a predicament precisely equivalent to Isaiah 5.20 where evil is good and good is evil. And light is dark and dark is light. Bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. But just because people will airbrush sin out of culture doesn't make sin disappear. It is very real and it plagues all of us. What do we do about it? Well, some would say just live a perfect life. I've had people tell me, preacher, I never sin. And they're just adding to the list. John wrote in 1 John 1, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. If you're thinking you can get to heaven by being perfect, you're going to fail and fail miserably. For there are none that do good and sin not. No, not one. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Or all sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, and I could go on. So if you're counting on your perfection, you're guaranteed failure. Well, what about just doing some mighty deed, some wonderful act? Well, I don't know what that wonderful act or mighty deed might be that could compensate for sin. There have been people in our civilization who have done really masterful, wonderful, great things. But none of them could overcome their personal plight of being sinners. There's nothing we can do to atone for our transgressions. Well, maybe we can just contribute a whole bunch of money. You know, money will get you about anything you want and very little of what you actually need. You cannot contribute enough to get a one-way ticket to heaven. Over the years, we have been, as a congregation, the beneficiaries of several substantial gifts. And on at least one or two of those occasions, I've heard people say they only gave because they're trying to buy their way into heaven. Well, I don't know where they got that idea. They certainly didn't get it from us. They didn't get it from the Word because it doesn't work that way. But still people try. We ought to be generous. We ought to rise to the occasion and meet real needs. With the blessings God has given us, we return to Him. But doing that alone will not compensate for our sins. You see, man has not come up with a single response that actually works. But what was God's answer? The cross, which in the first century to Jew and Greek, as we've said already from 1 Corinthians 1, was foolish. Can't work. Why, everybody knows that kings reign and then die. They don't die and then reign, but that's the message of the gospel. Jesus is reigning from heaven at the right hand of God over his kingdom right now. 
because he came into this world and went to Calvary and gave his life a ransom for sin. God's plan works. It's the only plan that works. And honestly, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people because they say it's just too simplistic. But what did Paul warn us against? Being led astray by the subtlety of the serpent as Eve was led astray. Little things over time can destroy even great faith. Never forget God's remedy for sin. The whole purpose of our surrounding the Lord's table today was to keep our focus on God's answer to every man's problem. Well, how do you honor God and his greatest gift? Well, we can have an eternal flame. There's one burning in Arlington Cemetery in memory of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I remember vividly the day that he was assassinated, coming home from school and the TV was on black and white, and they were reporting that terrible tragedy. I was not a fan of President Kennedy, but he was my president then. As a Christian, I prayed for him, and I was moved and saddened by his tragic death, as so many others were and should have been. It's a wonderful tribute to his memory, but you think that would begin to serve the correct purpose relative to Christ, or maybe we can build another monument like the one to Washington. I'm surprised it's still standing, aren't you? I think it's too tall and too strong for the anarchist to pull down. May we never, ever reach a point when we would consider such a thing. Washington was not perfect. In fact, there are no perfect men in our nation's history. But imperfect people sometimes do really wonderful things. And it's okay to honor them for the good they did. But do you think that would be appropriate to honor Jesus? Or maybe we can build great cathedrals. I took that picture, I think, when we were in La Jolla. Mormon temple. Beautiful structure. But it really doesn't honor Jesus. Another cathedral. Do you know most cathedrals today are nearly empty? Failed monuments to the master. You got another idea? I don't. Beyond the one that God gave. What was God's response? You know, a little bread and a little grape juice. Every Lord's Day, in his memory, proclaiming his death, this is the language of 1 Corinthians 11, until he come. The English Standard Version says, come again. I remember being called on the carpet as a youngster about the age of... Uh, Hunter Hackworth, for quoting incorrectly 1 Corinthians 11, you do show the Lord's death until he come again. In the King James, the word again is not there. And according to some, I had made a faux pas. I had misquoted scripture, but that is the meaning, and in the English Standard Version, because it is the meaning, it's there. And if you were a careful Bible student, you wouldn't make a fuss over something that is in every sense absolutely accurate unless you're trying to do something other than encourage. And sometimes we're like that. We look for the least little tiny fault to pick at. Now, unlike a lot of folks, I've got really thick skin. And I could pick right back. I don't apologize for defending what the Bible says, and I will defend it with vigor, with fervor, and with the thus saith the Lord. 
every Lord's Day, we proclaim the Lord's death till he come with these simple yet profound emblems. That's God's plan. But subtly, the serpent has led the multitudes astray. Most churches today don't commune every Lord's Day. They don't always commune with unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. I mentioned the Mormon tabernacle that I showed you a moment ago. They don't use fruit of the vine. They use water. Where do they find the authority for that in God's Word? It isn't there. But they're not concerned about that. True children of God are always concerned with the thus saith the Lord. We do what Jesus demanded, what the early church did, because it is the only really profound monument to the Master available to us. And if we are faithful to the plan, we will never lose sight of the man and the debt we owe. So what's the right response to the Savior's sacrifice? Well, the world says, just trust Jesus. I think I mentioned in the past there was a time when every day on the radio, Monday through Friday, I would hear someone say, remember, salvation is not tried but trust, not do but done, not healing but faith. What was the purpose of that? To undermine the credibility of Scripture and what is actually demanded. To say that you really don't have to do anything to be saved, just trust Jesus. Salvation is not tried, but trust, not feeling, but faith. Not do, but done. That's the follow-up statement that I would hear. And these gentlemen who were advocating this came before me and after me on radio. But the fact that they said it didn't make the truth any less true. The Bible does not say just trust Jesus. You can read it from cover to cover. You will not find that. Must we trust Jesus? Absolutely. But if we only acknowledge faith, but that faith doesn't produce in us a proper response, James chapter 2 calls that dead faith. And Jesus himself in the Gospel of John indicts those who believed on him but would not confess him because they feared the people, John 12, 42. You think that kind of trust saves? Of course not. That's dead faith, not living faith. And those who respond to this question by simply saying trust Jesus are not trusting him at all because they will not follow his word. And he follows up in John 12, 48 by saying, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Well, others will say, oh, you just need to pray through. As the Reformation movement in America began to unfold, this was the basic response of many to the question, what must we do to be saved? You need to pray through. Just go to the altar and get on your knees and pray until God finally saves you. And you'll have some sign, some experience, some way in which God will convey to you your salvation. It took men like Alexander Campbell and Raccoon John Smith and Barton Stone and others to convince people that they need to just go to the Bible and do what the Scriptures say. Never, never minimize the importance of prayer, but know that no one is saved by praying the sinner's prayer. You can't even find that prayer in Scripture, but that's not an issue with most because, as I said at the outset, most people don't pay much attention to the Scriptures. And here again, much like the concept of perfection, some would say, if you want to go to heaven, just be a good person and and do good deeds and treat your neighbor as you want to be treated yourself. I applaud treating your neighbor as you would want to be treated because that's Matthew 7, 12. But you can treat everybody according to the golden rule and still go to hell because you're not a child of God. Oh, you can't mean that, preacher. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say just trust Jesus. The Bible doesn't say just pray through. The Bible doesn't say just be a good person. Although I want to trust Jesus, 
I want to be a person of prayer and I want to treat people correctly and do good. But that is not God's answer. God's answer is, and it is explicit in the New Testament, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16, 16. What shall we do, they cried. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus encountered Saul on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. He sent him into the city where he was to wait until one would come and tell him what he needed to do. Who came? Ananias. What did he say? Saul, why do you tarry? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. You may say, preacher, I don't think that's necessary. Years ago, I would guess probably now 30 years ago, we had a mother and her daughter attend our services on the Lord's Day. Diane and I visited them in a follow-up the next week. Her response was, we enjoyed the service, enjoyed the message, but you will never get me in the water. I don't think that has any bearing on where anyone will be eternally. But there's the problem. What we think is inconsequential when God has spoken. What did Naaman say? I thought. I thought the prophet would come out and strike his hand over the place and call upon his God. And none of that happened. He sent a servant out with the instruction, go and wash seven times in the Jordan. It's just that simple. Now, I don't believe that this is the end of our response to Jesus. It's the beginning. That's why it's called in John chapter 3, the new birth. It is where we come into Christ, into his church, have our sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, are added to the body, our names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and we begin a journey that will, if we are faithful and stay on the straight of narrow, lead us ultimately into the presence of God. I don't know how to make it any simpler than that because that is the simplicity that is in Christ. So are you going to be on your guard against the serpent's subtlety? Are you going to be a student of the Word so you don't let those little changes ultimately because you think they don't matter sink your ship? I said last week, I will say again today, I don't have any authority to make any laws God hasn't made or any authority to set aside those He has made. And I can't force anyone to do anything. The choice is yours. How will you respond to Jesus? How will you live your life? How will you treat people? How will you be faithful to the one who gave his all? That's the message. You need to do with it what God would want you to do with it without delay. We invite you to respond to his call as together we stand and sing. I welcome to thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is a true one, he is a just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten to glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he will.
paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beside me, there will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Closing song will be number 446. Thank you, Roger, for another excellent message. I like things easy rather than hard. And Danette will tell you I'm as simple as they come. So both of those things will really work out to my benefit that God has made it easy and simple for us to understand what he has expectation-wise for us. A few announcements to share with you among our sick. Uh, George Pickens, that's Carolyn Kimball's brother. He was in the hospital is uh, staying with family in Huntington while he addresses the infections that he has before they can uh, deal with his heart situation. So keep him in your prayers. Uh, she says he is improving, and he is scheduled to go back to the doctor on August 25th to look at um, scheduling his heart uh, bypasses. Also in Tennessee, in ICU is Clarence Deloche. We uh, mentioned recently that he is improving. He's out of the coma. He is responsive, so that is good news. Um, mentioned, too, that I placed uh, George's uh, address on the bulletin board if you'd like to send him a card or something of that nature. And uh, several people asked about an address for Clarence, so uh, we believe we can get a hold of that, and we'll put that on the board as well. We extend our sympathy to the family of Steve Baldwin. That's Carla's brother. Memorial services were not yet complete at the time the announcements were, were put together. There is a card shower plan for Joanna Thomas. She'll be turning 100 on July 27th. Her address is out on the bulletin board if you'd like to participate in that. And if you uh, took one of the bottles for the Women's Care Center, uh, hopefully you brought that back today because I believe those are going down first of the week this week. Again, thank everyone who takes a public part. Uh, as our numbers are down, we have a tendency to, to scramble to find people, so so glad when people are willing to fill in and do that. And uh, following our final song this morning, uh, Les Mills will have our closing prayer. Number 446, 446. If you're able to, please stand. Mm -hmm. When my way grow a dream, precious Lord, linger near, when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, take my hand, precious
softly, please. Gracious and Heavenly Father, what a blessing to be here this day and, and hear the message that we heard this day, God. With all the stuff going on in this nation, may we never forget that you're in control. You sent your son here to teach us how to be, God, to how to live our lives, and we thank you that we can lead to him and read your word and get encouragement when we see stuff going on like it is. We didn't know that it's just Satan. We also know that he's on the losing side, God. He is a loser. And he influences a lot of people in this world. But we can combat that with our words and our actions. And we just thank you for the example that we have in our big brother. When we get discouraged, may we always remember that he left heaven to come here and die on a cross on our behalf. So the things that we go through in this life doesn't compare. We thank you for your example. We thank you for the church here. We thank you for the congregation, for Roger and everybody, everything they do here, God. Be with the sick and afflicted, and we thank you so much for taking care of us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 